Today's story is another by the wonderfully talented Aslin Dragonhawk. Raw Head and Bloody Bones There are various versions of this story, but this is the story told around campfires and at slumber parties in the part of the world where I grew up. I hope you enjoy it. The cabin sat in a remote holler in West Virginia. It was just after the Civil War, and much of the new state was still considered frontier with its deep narrow valleys and the hollers that winded their ways up the mountains. Here the heartiest people lived and they brought with them tales of the weird and uncanny from faraway places remembered only by the very old. These stories were added to by the strange goings on in the remote communities where a neighbour might be a day's ride away. Here families lived together in multiple generations and they would not have it any other way. The large cabins had been built over those generations as children grew and married and brought their families to live in added rooms to the first structure. Such was the cabin of the Ferrells. The cabin had been built by Jeremiah Ferrell in the late 1700s and Jeremiah's son, Matthew, had married Olivia and brought her home. They had built the room off the main cabin. Matthew had a son, William, and he had married Mary Ellen, and she and another room had been built on the opposite side. They had two sons and a daughter, and two more rooms had been built onto the cabin. Big Jacob and Petey, the baby, had shared one room, and Elizabeth, his daughter, and the middle child, had the luxury of her own room. Just now, the family were relaxing before the fire. William was carving on a little wooden doll for Ellen. She was a young lady doll, with arms hinged at the shoulders by two tiny eyelet hooks, and her legs the same at the hips. Jacob was cleaning his rifle which he'd won at the turkey shoot. Petey was reading about Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves. Elizabeth was crocheting another blanket. Ma was washing the last pot and setting it on the still warm stove to dry. She took her wash pan and took it to the door and splashed it onto the wet ground and closed the door back and made fast the old peg lock for the night. She took the pan back and slid it under her work table and hung the wash rag on the little nail by the window. The fire was merry in the fireplace and there was plenty of wood and the clean silver grey floors were covered with a great bearskin. There was the smell of the wood burning and the sweet smell of the gun oil Jacob was using. Granny was in her rocker, her throne, and she looked like a queen with her proud head and her crown of white hair braided and pinned up around her head neatly. Her legs were covered in a crocheted quilt Elizabeth had made her. She was puffing on the small clay pipe, a little wreath of sweet tobacco circling around her. The only sound was the tapping of the insistent rain on the heavy slate roof. Mary Ellen always felt safe in this old cabin. It was so well made and maintained. It had seen them through bad snows and heavy storms and raging heat. Mary Ellen went to her little chair and picked up her own sewing and began to mend a shirt for her husband. "'Tell us a story, Gran,' said Petey. Petey was a slight little fella who had a pale complexion and looked as if he was on a diet of fish food. Ma always thought he had tapeworm but Pa said he was saving energy for his growth spurt. Gran seemed to be thinking it over. She was the repository of a thousand and one stories, like the tales of Arabian Nights her son was reading. Gran made a soft sound and seemed to have made up her mind. Folks said it was old Eliza Vance who started all the trouble that ended with all of his kin being killed off on their homestead in the next holler on Black Fog Mountain, said the old woman. All eyes were upon her as she spoke. Oh, now, Granny, don't tell that one. Petey will wet the bed if you do, said Ma. No, I won't, Ma, I promise, swore Petey. Gran said nothing, just smoked her pipe and waited for permission to be given. She smiled and showed where one of her teeth had bid farewell to her mouth last year as she puffed the stem and blew away the smoke. All right, then. But I don't want to smell wet on you in the morning, said Ma. Well now, let me see. I remember it was a hot fall day, what we call an Indian summer, 
and I was just a girl then. Back then were still Indians living not far from the settlements, and they lived not far from the Vances. All Elizer decided to take his three boys out in the woods to see if they couldn't get some deer to make jerked venison for the winter. Seemed the Vances just never had enough to eat because their soil was just so worn out and what little bit of corn he grew was made into sour mash. Eliza Vance was saddling his old swayback mare and waiting for his no-account sons Darius, Caesar and Rom to come out and get their gear together. He'd put out a salt lick and deer could not resist it. He checked his knife and his gun and grabbed his empty game bags, and when he came back to his horse, his sons appeared. Eliza had raised three of the most worthless boys on the planet, and the orneriest gals on the holler, and the woman he married was just as rough. It was a good thing she was, because his ma and pa were tough mean old birds. The four headed into the woods and took the shortest but most dangerous route into the woods, and that was through the old Indian burying place. Everyone knew it was dangerous to walk around in their burying place. They didn't like it, but Eliza didn't care. Indians were godless heathens anyway, and he didn't have to do them any respect anyhow. They came home later that evening with a scrawny deer that would not feed them but for a couple of days. The scanty stew was less than satisfying and the family went to bed quarrelsome and hungry. The next morning, Eliza woke up and ambled out of the outhouse, and when he was done, he came out and found a curious thing. It was a small pile of stones. Among the stones were what appeared to be teeth, whether human or animal he could not tell, and there, in the centre, was a black raven's feather. Them engines had sighted him in their burying grounds, and they were none too pleased about it. To hell with you, you heathens! I goes where I damn please, he shouted. That day, he and the boys wandered up to the still where they were cooking up a batch of moonshine, and they simply never came back. Well, Pa and the boys didn't come back, but his old swayback mare did, and they found a bloody handprint on the haunch of that nag, and everyone knew what that meant. The sheriff was obliged to go up and see about getting the bodies, if there'd be anything left. Indians were known to demand stiff penalties for trespassing on their lands. They did find the bodies. The boys were not in bad shape, just scuffed up with all of their throats slit. But Pa, Pa was in bad shape. He looked as though they'd started scalping him at his toes and ended with his haircut, and what was left was raw and bloody, and Pa's eyes were bulging from his bony, gory face. They set up a great howling over the dead man and his sons at the Vance place. They screamed at the sheriff and the deputies that had gone after them to go and bring those savages to justice. The sheriff shook his head. All Eliza knew better than to fool with that old burying ground. Even the smallest child knows not to go there. The way I see it, he and the boys deserved it. The howling didn't stop there. The preacher stopped by while they were preparing the bodies. The boys in their Sunday best, Pa just wrapped in a sheet because his body wasn't fit for clothes. The preacher said he needed five dollars apiece for the burying, and the Vances only had fifteen dollars. So that meant there was one who would have to be buried outside the church grounds, in unhallowed ground. Now you could scratch, maybe there were times where you felt you just couldn't go on living, but no one got buried outside the church grounds. If you weren't buried in sanctified ground, you couldn't get into heaven. Then the family put up a ruckus about who would be buried outside the church grounds. After much debate, it was reckoned that Eliza should be buried outside the hallowed ground. It was him that got the boys killed, as he was the one that guided those boys through the Indian grounds. Besides, the boys looked good in their Sunday go-to meeting clothes. There just wasn't much left of Pa to dress up. They buried the boys with a proper public funeral, and then the family was carried home and everyone on the mountain brought them food and drink that would last them a long while. Pa, they buried privately, without sorrow and weeping, but fearful attention befitting someone who was destined for hell. It was quite the scandal, and the people on the mountain chewed the fat on that piece of gossip. But as time does, winter finally moved on, and spring came, and then summer, and 
and the Vances found themselves no better than they were the year before. One of Vance's girls got married and brought her husband, a good enough old boy, just dumb as a rock, to come and live with her and her folks in a little room that had been attached to the ramshackle cabin. He wasn't a bad fella, just stupid and doless. No matter though, he was the only one to survive the things that happened as the summer gave way to the fall, and it was coming up on the anniversary of the death of Eleazar and his sons. It started with the sound of a hoot owl at the witness tree in the middle of the day, an omen of bad things to come. Then they made their way to church and laid out flowers to the boys' graves, but forgot about Pa. When they got home, they found the old swayback mare had died, the only survivor of the massacre. An old Granny Vance said that it must have been what the owl was hooting about. Being a family of economy, Grandpa Vance and the new husband set to butchering that stringy old horse, and they threw the hide and the bones over the hillside to rot. Then, when Ma went to get eggs and milk to make cornbread for the old stew of the horse meat, she discovered the eggs she cracked were bloody and the yolks and milk was rancid, even though it was fresh milk. The butter had done the same thing. This cast a pile over the Vances as they ate their breadless meal of greasy, stringy, horse meat stew. After dinner, the whole family turned in early, hoping this day would pass them by. The moon rose high in the sky, big and full and yellow, and the wind that usually blew a refreshing breeze down the valley dies away and left a stifling heat. No one slept. Even the night bugs, the crickets, the catchids did not sing to each other. It was as though the woods were watching, waiting. In the churchyard just beyond the stone wall, the earth began to heave up as if something weird were trying to grow out of the forsaken soil. At first it seemed like tree roots, but then a large, black, honey hand opened up and stretched, as they were achy from being clenched. The hand kept reaching out until there was a shoulder free. The arm bent at the elbow and the hand planted on the ground and began to push up until a large, reddish, black egg shape appeared, and from it peered two bloody eyeballs, peering lidless to the dark. The other hand wiggled free and pushed out the torso, its gory xylophone ribs filled in with the black earth and worms and centipedes. It pushed harder with both hands and arms, and out came the hips and legs. For a moment he stretched and relished the freedom from the confines of the unholy earth that held him prisoner. Finally, the thing that was Eleazar Vance yawned. His jaw snapped with a bony click, and looked up at the big, full full moon, and turned on his heels and began to walk home. Ma Vance was the first to think something was amiss in the dark of the night. There was a sound of scrabbling in the chimney. At first she thought it was a raccoon. It was not unheard of for critters to come down a fireless chimney and get food from the larder and make a mess. She got up out of bed and slipped out in her bare feet into the main room. She could see the fireplace, dark and cold, and she could make out the firebrands by the hearth. She went stealthily as a cat and grabbed one of the firebrands, squatted by the hearth, and poked it up into the flue. Something grabbed hold and would not let go. She duck walked closer to the fireplace and bent low to look up into the chimney, when the dark head popped out, upside down, grinned at her with his bony grin. Its hands came forward and tried to grab her. She screamed and in a panic she fell forward and those grasping arms and those skeletal fingers grabbed her and pulled her up the chimney. The family heard the screaming and Grandpa came out with his rifle and the son-in-law did the same. The youngest of the Vance girls lit the kerosene lamp and held it high over her head and cast the yellow light over the room. The last thing they saw going up the chimney were Ma's bare feet. Suddenly, there was a sickening crunch and a ripping sound, and the body of Miss Vance fell into the fireplace and slid sideways. One of the girls screamed. Her head had been torn clean off. Shut up, girl, ordered Grandpa. The girl, holding onto the kerosene lamp, set it on the kitchen table and went to sit on the settee. The old man and the son-in-law stood, still listening for the intruder. 
All he could hear were the scrabbling sounds of the thing in the chimney. Boy, get your horse, said the old man. The young man looked loath to leave the house to cross the backyard to the lean-to barn where his horse was kept. That meant he would be out there with that thing, whatever it was, and God only knew where it was. The son-in-law crossed the room and went out the front door. He ran blindly to the barn. When he reached the door, he heard a terrible scream and ran back to the house. From the front yard, he could see the front door was flung wide open and there stood the silhouette of a skinny man in the doorway. Hey! he yelled as he ran back towards the porch. The thing turned to him and the boy stopped in his tracks. It opened its jaws just a fraction in a lipless grin and from out of its throatless mouth came a single word that sounded like, RUN. The boy, accustomed to taking orders all of his life, did just as he was told. He ran to the barn and jumped on the horse's bare back and took off. The horse ran blindly out of the barn while whatever was in the house began its work in earnest. He could hear the screams and the repeated cries of, NO! PA! NO! and the sound of old Grandpa Vance getting a shot off. The boy stayed turned around so long that he did not see the low-hanging branch that hit him in a wallop on the back of his head. He fell off the horse and onto the ground. Finally, all was silent, and the thing in the house turned and looked all around the room. Grandpa lay on the settee with the barrel of his rifle shoved deeply into his chest. One of his daughters, with a look of horror on her face, lay looking permanently over her shoulder because it had twisted her clean around. His other daughter was sitting straight up against the cook stove, head in her lap. The eldest daughter, the one whose husband had taken off with his horse, was lying across their bed with her skull caved in. An old granny was sitting straight up in her bed. Of all the deaths that night, hers was the most humane, because there was not a mark on her. It appeared she died of fright. The thing turned and spotted the old silver mirror on the wall by the door. It stood there, looking at its gruesome face, the wide, lidless eyes, the rictus grin, the red, dripping blood. It lifted its finger and wrote two words on the mirror, and went out of the door, leaving bloody footprints behind. It walked into the night and scented something in the air. He followed the scent to the edge of the hill. It was a rich, corrupt, fleshy scent. It sniffed again into the fleshless holes that had been a nose once, and then called softly, Horse. A great rustling sound was heard over the hill, and then there was a distinct sound of clomping hooves. The bones of the old sway-backed horse came up out of the brambles and stood in the moonlight road. The thing reached up and stroked its skinless head and leapt up onto its fleshless vertebrae and began to clomp down the road. At the same time, the hapless boy who'd been knocked off his horse was coming too, trying to shake some sense back into his head. His horse was standing off to the side, nibbling on some weeds. He jumped back on the horse and started going down the road towards the White's farm, about six miles away. It wasn't long till he heard the sound of another horse behind him. Thank God, mister, he said, turning to look at the other rider. It was the thing, perched high on that bloody horse's back. The boy screamed and hide his horse and did not stop or look back till he came to the White's farm. He jumped from the horse's back and ran up to the porch and pounded on the door. Old Ansel White opened the door and saw the terrified boy. They brought him in and tried to calm him down and make sense of his terrified babbling, but all they could get out of him was... Raw head, raw head and bloody bones. So what happened, Granny? asked Petey. His brothers and sisters all wore the same wide-eyed expressions as the little boy. Even Jake was listening, filling his pipe again and passing it to his pa who was listening without meaning to. Well, of course now, the sheriff came to the van's house and he just shook his head. He got his deputies to come and get the bodies and bring them to the undertaker. Of course, there wasn't any money in the house, so the bodies were buried outside the churchyard walls. After the undertaker buried the Vances, 
he notice a fresh, turned out but unmarked grave just inside the churchyard. Suddenly, it all made sense, said Granny. What made sense? What did the thing write on the mirror? asked Petey. Old Eliza had wrote, Hallowed ground on the mirror in his own blood. Now, whenever a family gets to squalling and fussing and fighting amongst themselves, they remember the Vance family and how raw head and bloody bones paid them a call. <laughs> 